Carl Flecker. Uh, Carl wrote a, a fantastic research report for PSA C901. Um, it was concerning uh, defunding the police. It was concerning issues around uh, police violence, uh, all stemming from, of course, uh, the events of summer 2020, um, in, including the murder of George Floyd, uh, as well as uh, the protests that uh, came after around police brutality all across North America and around the world, really. Um, so I guess first uh, I'll just ask, and, and we talked about it a little before we started get started getting going. But so how did how did you come to this role uh, in terms of uh, deciding to to do this research uh, for PSAC nine hundred one, and uh, what did you want to bring to it um, in terms of your own experience? Thanks, Joshua. I appreciate your your introduction and comments. Um, what motivated me was it was interesting to see a local um, show an interest and put. It's some of its resources on the table to start with a research base to inform their campaign. And I thought that's unique. That's not something that you see every other day. Sorry, just got a call here. I have to pass on. Um, my apologies. No problem. Kid two. <laughs> um, so that, that was the first thing. And as I mentioned, the other is that uh, my wife and I had spent 2019, we spent a year in Myanmar, which is a, you know, the country on the planet with the longest civil running civil war, uh, an oppressive military regime, and so it's it represents you know some of the worst parts of a carceral state, and it also has you know in, incredible pockets of of progressive revolutionary resistance. So returning to Canada and seeing an opportunity to apply some of that lived experience in Myanmar, where people are challenging oppressive and carceral states in its worst forms, um, to being in Kingston and saying, uh, let's let's line up with this union um, and with activists who are wanting to, to challenge this on a, a progressive research base. And I guess the other important thing is it's, it's a moment of critical mass. I mean, the, the, the people who've been murdered by police has a long history. And yet suddenly, as you mentioned with George Floyd and others before him that were murdered at the hands of police, something has changed. Something has awoken the populace in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. And it struck me that this is an important opportunity to, to lend a little bit of my research skills and campaigning uh, experience to uh, a moment in time. And did I mention I was bored in my day job? <laughs> <laughs> Always a good reason to do some research on the side. That's that's great. Thank you, thank you, Carl. Um, I know in your in your research report, um, you did a little background research on sort of where the carceral state, as well as sort of policing in Canada, came from. And, and so I was wondering if you could just give a little bit of background on on how we got to the point we are today. I guess. Um, yeah, that's a long history, I know. So, <laughs> well, I'll just pick a few snippets, and there's many researchers and academics who've done a, a much better job than I in terms of looking at the long history. But some interesting pieces were 18th, 19th century. Um, you know, the, the creation of the municipal councils and local governance included the ability for those same municipal councils to set up their police forces. And so not surprisingly, the folks who are sitting on municipal councils are very interested and influential individuals. They're the, they're the in essence, the, the elites of the time. And so why wouldn't you establish a police force to protect your interests, which is, of course, what they did in, and, and through that, through their establishment of of police service bodies and so on, and then appoint people who they would be interested in and trust to protect their interests. Now, you know, even before that, of course, is policing in the during the transatlantic slave trade, and when it slowly came to a, a halt, the um, the in the in the U.S.'s deep south, they the slave owners were very peeved at losing their property. And so establishing police forces that would go and track down their property and return those slaves to those owners became a function not only of uh, the police, but also of the RCMP. So those origins are really important. Let's jump ahead to a little bit more recent history. Um, and you see in 1995, oh, sorry, there was, there was a, a little piece in there when um, for the issues of appearance, they wanted to create a separation between the police function, police services, mm -hmm. and pol politicians. So there's an illusion of separation mm -hmm. that those two bodies would be separate. 
Um, but in fact, we know that that was not to be the case. And so jump to 1995 and you have Mike Harris, Premier of Ontario, you have an Indigenous community, the Stony Point Band, uh, saying the land in a certain provincial park is not yours, it's ours, and we're going to occupy it. And Mike Harris says, one of the things uh, he's, he's believed to have said, quote, I, unquote, I want those fucking Indians out of the park, end quote. The former Attorney General Charles Harwick, who had conducted an investigation after the, the murder by the police of Dudley George, uh, he said, uh, quote, after carefully assessing the evidence, it's my view that Michael Harris made the statement. The reason why I point to that story is very clear and current example exposing the illusion that there is a separation between uh, police and politicians. Uh, an obviously even more recent one is the fact that we have crime scenes across Canada on residential school sites, former residential school sites. And unless I missed it, I have yet to hear a national, provincial, or municipal police force pull out its band of yellow tape and say, we found a crime scene and, and let's go knock on some hallowed doors and conduct some investigations. It's not happened yet. So another example, I think, of uh, for the, the folly of separation. Thank you for doing that, because that, I think, is very important to sort of bring us up to where our policing came from in, in Canada, where the carceral state came from. I think that's really important as a sort of grounding point for our conversation. Um, so we talked a bit about what what's happening currently and why people are interested and why why movements have coalesced around the ideas of sort of various ideas, including everywhere from say, sort of police reform to abolishment um, and sort of also other terms like detasking and especially sort of defunding might be the biggest one. Can you give us a sense of sort of what those terms mean, how they how they differ um, and, and sort of what people who advocate for them are, want essentially? Sure, uh, I'll start by prefacing. I'm, I'm certainly no expert on definitional terms. Um, I, I will happily um, hand that over to some academics who, who thrive on that kind of examples. Sure. Um, but I will offer my understanding of these terms. Um, reform to me is, this is what people are talking about when they want to introduce sensitivity training, diversity hiring, cultural awareness you know, uh, amongst the police. And, and really what they want to do also is they want to maintain the definitions of what and, and functions of what policing is and on whom. They just want to do it in a more liberal and um, deceivingly uh, uh, equitable manner. Um, and I, it's also an approach that's been advocated for and tried for decades with what result, you know, are police forces really any more diverse or are they just decorated versions of the same with tokenism? Um, detasking, I think is, you know, removing some police services from legislative authority. And here's where I think we might differ in some people's definitions. I think pro-privatization forces are very interested in detasking some police functions mm -hmm. because they wanna take on the business of moving prisoners uh, from prisons, from jails to court and back and forth. And they want to do that on a for-profit basis. Mm. And then there are other aspects of policing that they might want to take on. For example, um, supplying some of the more advanced technology and equipment that allows for surveillance and monitoring um, and, and dealing with digital crimes and so on. So that detasking, I think, is, de is separate from which camp is interested in doing that. There are members of the progressive slash liberal community that also want to detask in the sense of saying, well, we take a look at our local crime data and many of the calls are related to mental health. And uh, the guy or the gal who spent um, 16 or 19 weeks at, at Elmer Police College may not be adequately educated and trained in dealing with mental health issues. So we wanna take that component of those calls out and do it with people who are trained. And that detasking actually also becomes a way of collaboration. So now the police respond and saying, okay, that's an interesting idea. Why don't we have some of your uh, mental health experts ride along with us in the police car when we are responding to mental health calls? We, if and when that situation escalates to the point where uh, uh, police intervention is required with a batons, tear gas, 
or our, our physical training, we will step in. But if you can defuse the situation with your up and coming mental health graduate, ride along with us and um, maybe we can cut costs or split the budget lines. So that's, I think that's a part of detasking, okay? But again, like reform, I don't think it fundamentally challenges the carceral state or the notion of whose property and whose interests am I interested in protecting. That comes up now to defunding. And defunding, I think, is the much more um, broader vision. And it's about saying clearly, we want to end the end increasing handover of tax dollars, public tax dollars, to police services that have grown out of scope and that are increasingly addicted to dangerous and invasive privacy-based technologies. Defunding is actually about changing the legislative framework and the societal notion that we need a, uh, a violently armed and prepared uh, troop that will protect our interests against your interests. Okay? And it, 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 defunding in this context is actually asking us to think about what does community safety look like? and for whom, and how can we achieve it? There's a really bad series, movie franchise out called The Purge, mm. um, and some people may have seen it. I'm sure some academics might wanna make parallels between The Purge and defunding. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's viewing things in a very different lens. Uh, and I, I only say that a little glibly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you've seen the series. I haven't seen it, but I know I know roughly what it's about. I think it's it, it's uh, there's a, a period of time in which all law is sort of lifted. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. And the only only parallel that I'm making there half in jest is it's a moment when you see things very differently. Right. And and, you know, to be fair, what the defunding movement, I think, is talking about is they're saying, yeah, let's let's see things very differently, not from the the purge context, but let's see it from community safety context and who could do that and how best might we go about doing it. Right. And, right. and with $15 billion a year being spent on policing across this country, it's not like there's a shortage of uh, potential bankrolling there. Okay. No and so, and so you talked about sort of the reform and detask, um, as well as uh, sort of the more the defund, which I, you kind of made a separation between those two camps. And then what about uh, abolishment? Where does that, how does that fit in? Yeah, I think abolishment is, is again, um, you know, on the, if, if there's a spectrum, it's, it's very much to the left side of that spectrum, where we're saying um, there isn't a need to have prisons, there isn't a need to have police, um, and that that the notion of community safety would be accomplished because you would have created a, a mutual aid culture within society where people would be watching out for everybody. It's, it's very visionary um, and it's very interesting. Um, I'm not aware of, a, of a, a culture or society that has evolved or matured to that point, but I haven't met all of the cultures on the planet. Um, I suppose one might argue that there are indigenous communities that have uh, essentially created certain types of society where they don't have the same form of carceral state that we currently have. They have, um, you know, uh, notions of accountability and responsibility and punishment that is is meted out in a very different way. Um, restoration, um, justice and restorative justice, those kinds of approaches. So. You know, the, the thing in terms of campaigning is, and, and I shared this, I think, with some activists locally, um, I think that all of those definitions and the people who are drawn to them are important to engage in the campaign. I, I think of my conversation with a good longtime friend when I was doing this research, and, and he immediately uh, recoiled at the notion of defund and abolish. And he positioned himself into the reform category of saying, you know, just more training, better hiring. Right. And over time in the conversation back and forth, he began to shift his understanding because he recognized his life experience had put him into interactions with the police that were very different than my interactions with the police. And so I just share that anecdotal story because I think it's not, it's too simplistic to put people into these camps. There's a continuum there. Mm -hmm. And, and that as people, whether they be liberally motivated or charitably motivated, enter into from the reform, the dialogue must naturally cause people to inquire more, 
understand more and shift their thinking towards something different that is closer to defund and or abolish. Whether we get there or not, that's the, the poster, you know, it's not about the, the destination, it's the journey or whatever that thing is. <laughs> Right. I guess another way you can put that is shoot for the stars and uh, land on the moon. Bingo. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think so. That's great. I think we have a, a pretty good grounding now of where policing came from in Canada, as well as sort of the different sort of ideas and movements around uh, how to transform policing um, in, in Canada. Can we could speak a bit about uh, what does policing in Kingston look like today, I guess? Um, what's sort of the function of police? Uh, has it changed over time if it has? What kind of roles do they serve? Sure. You know, I, I've lived in Kingston, I think, 35 years now. You know, um, I think 36 years ago, we threw a dart at a map and it landed on the Kingston and we said we'd give it a try for 24 months. We thought that would be long term. Yeah. Um, so you know, over that time, and we've had, I've had a number of personal interactions with the police for different reasons. Um, everything from, um, you know, uh, violent and racist neighbors to um, interactions with the police when our children were in school and, and threatened by other children and a whole host of kind of uh, interactions. And That's over that idea. period of time, I would say, you know, the, the force has grown over that period of time. Um, but essentially their function has been the same, protect capital and protect the interests of the powerful. That has been my summation. Um, but more recently, I think the more substantive changes we're seeing uh, a police services board and the choice of their leadership to be much more savvy in terms of their political positioning of what the police uh, is about. And you know, they've, they've got a chief of police earning over $250,000, a quarter of a million dollar salary. Um, who is quick to uh, rebrand the notion of the community, of policing as a community services, you know, to brand it as just that, a community service. Their five-year strategic plan documents an interest in, in, in the perception of the police in the public. Notice right. that the plan doesn't say um, deal with the substantive nature of policing, it's just to deal with the perception of policing. The recent move by the Kingston Police to partner with Kingston Community Health Centers in what they call the Kingston Speaks Inclusion colon community consultations hosted by Kingston Police and Kingston Community Health Centers, aside from the fact that their branding efforts fell short in that tagline, um, <clears throat> you really couldn't come up with something smoother than that. <laughs> um, but, but there's an example of, of the police working very, uh, um, smoothly, savvy, in a savvy way with a respected community agency to, uh, in the words of the police, uh, to increase, how can the police increase equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigenization, E-D-I-I -I in brackets, throughout their organization, end quote. Um, so you ask, how has it changed? Well, here's an example of how it has not changed. The police force person whom they chose to represent this initiative introduced himself this way, quote, I realize that I am a white heterosexual male with tremendous privilege. In this new role, I will be thinking about what that privilege means and will be learning as much as I can about how underrepresented groups experience the police in Kingston. I look forward to working with our chief, our core unit, our board and members of our community, they come last, Okay, to make equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigenization a priority. And I look forward to learning and growing in this new role with guidance from our community, end quote. I am thrilled that we are paying in excess of $147,000 for this fuck nut to learn. <laughs> so that's, that's him coming into the role where he is meant to actually implement um, strategies to, to diversify, I guess, the police force and. Yeah, I mean, the, the, to me, this is, a, this is an example of the savvy positioning, okay? Yeah. The legislation um, that is coming down the pike is gonna require every municipality to come up with a community and safety well-being plan. It also requires every police services board to have a diversity plan. One of the components of that is to hold community consultations. Right. Bingo, okay? So this is, this is killing the whole flock of birds, okay? with one, uh, uh, what is it? White heterosexual male with, pri with known privilege. What actually will come from this um, to be seen and, and uh, 
you know, in, in a different period in my life, I might have said, you know, let's be fair and wait and see. But, you know, those nine minutes where George Floyd died and hundreds before him have died, I'm less tolerant for waiting out the nine minutes. I think a lot of people share that, share that sentiment. Um, can we speak a bit about how much um, of the sort of municipal budget and sort of how, how much is really being taken up by the police specifically and sort of like where, how, how is that being spent and um, relative to sort of, you know, other things that people want to see in their, in their community? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, again, in my report, this is the boring part of the numbers, but the, the bottom line is a very significant chunk of the city's, um, you know, roughly $400 million budget is going to police services. And now the police, they they count the dollars a different way against tax expenditures so that their percentage presentation is significantly different than the one I'm going to share. But I'm gonna go with this one because I think it's the more accurate way to present how much money. So in 2019, the city has a total municipal budget of 388 million uh, and change. Um, the police gets 41 million, uh, 909,000. So 10.7% of the budget. In 2020, the municipal budget increases to 43 million and change. Um, and the police budget correspondingly goes up to 41 million. Okay, um, and now it represents 11% of the municipal budget. Okay, so and and if you compare those expenditures against things like housing and transportation and other municipal services, these guys are skyrocketing out of the park. Now you know it's significant when the Fraser Institute issues a report saying the the rising price of police services is getting to be an issue for them. Now if there if there isn't a bellwether out there saying holy fuck the right-wing economic pundits, their concern, you know you've passed the point of control, okay? So $41 million in change, and how many people? 211 officers, 61 full-time civilian members, 28 part-time civilian. Of the 211, one is off on long-term disability, seven are off on WSIB claims, two are on sick leave, and four have been suspended with pay, and six officers are working with outside agencies, such as the repeat offender, parole equipment, enforcement squad, and the provincial human trafficking intelligence-led joint force strategy. Again, long-winded titles. Bottom line, I'm trying to remember the last time I worked with an organization that had in excess of $41 million and you couldn't get the entire workforce onto two or three big yellow school buses. Wow. That's this, is a, this is a big chunk of dough. And again, if you look at the police services board's breakdown of their 40 plus odd million dollars, the vast majority of that goes into personnel, okay? Mm -hmm. So the Kingston Police Service Board data shows the average police personnel's annual salary is over $147,000. In my research, I did some comparison of what the salaries are for our sexual assault crisis center, Kingston yeah. Employment Youth Services. We're, we're talking at best $40,000, $45,000 a year salaries. And uh, you know, I, I, having worked in some of these shops, I know these numbers, but the, the scale here of what you are buying in terms of talent, you know, uh, the community service across the board, you need university education, you need uh, a variety of skill sets, you need to have diversity, you might often need to have multilingual background. How many weeks at police college? 147,000. I haven't even touched overtime yet. So um, it's significant. How does it compare with other municipalities? The Globe and Mail did a data analysis on 25 Canada's largest police forces in 2019. At the time, Kingston wasn't included, but I just did ran some numbers and said, okay, well, where would Kingston have placed using their 2019 dollars when they were getting 10.8% of the municipal budget? And that puts Kingston police expenditures in between the big cities of Montreal and Calgary. Now, I would just ask your members, does it feel like we live in Montreal or Calgary? These are, these are uh, shocking rates of expenditure. That, that, I mean, that, that's a huge percentage. And when you put it in comparison to other community services, it, it's really striking. Um, yeah. in, terms of, in terms of sort of how that budget gets set, how much control actually 
does the municipal government have over over the police budget that they see? Okay, so you've got zero control, and then okay. you've got like one line above that. Okay. Okay, and so it's in between uh, zero and that one line. Wow. So the the legislative setup is such that um, municipalities must provide police services and five core functions they must provide. And if they don't, then the OP, the Ontario Provincial Police will provide it. Um, they must receive the budget from the Police Services Board, which will have some of municipal councillors serving on that body. The body will also um, involve appointments that are made by the province. And so you take a look at who those appointments are. <clears throat> um, and so then the Police Service Board crafts this budget. And in the case of Kingston, Kingston's uh, Municipal Council set guidelines for the entities that they fund and said, we want you to stay within this guidelines in, in order to keep our bu budgets balanced. But the police exceeded that on the last round in the 2021. They, they said, we're not going to stay within that guideline. The Mayor Patterson actually signaled during that process that he was content that they had a good rationale for exceeding the guideline. Mm -hmm. But let me come back to your question. The, the Municipal Council does not have the ability to say no. They do not have the legislative authority to say, no, we will not fund that. They receive it and they right. must accept it. That's what it boils down to. Now, if there is a debate, they can go to the Ontario Police Civilian Commission and debate it, but then you have to, and maybe that's the next set of questions is, is okay, who's on that and what's been the track record? There's just been a handful of cases where municipalities have been in, in conflict with the Police Services Board, never in a case of reducing it, always in a case of increasing it. And that the outcomes of that, that body, uh, of which there's been 70 some odd appointments made over time, has been to reinforce what the police service board wants, to either give it what it wants or to give it more. And, and so the, the key here is, and this is coming to the defund campaign, is the legislative system is designed to make that demand impossible to legislatively argue for. And I'll come later to a, a, a wording nuance where you might say, well, hang on a second, <laughs> you know? Um, but my, my point is, is that um, the municipality doesn't have the ability to be able to say no to the cop shop. So the police services board, the, sorry, the municipality comes up with this sort of framework, the police services board comes up with a, a budget, even if it exceeds that framework, there's still almost no recourse or, or no ability for the municipality and the elected officials uh, or count city councillors and the mayor to actually say, to actually ref, sort of say, no, you have to go back and you, you have to live within the means that we said, that doesn't exist. The Correct. There's, there's no meaningful oversight at the municipal level, which is again, a very funny thing. That, and this is where the savviness kinds of comes into play. I mentioned earlier, the police service board presents their budget relative right. to taxes raised. Okay. And of course, then the percentage looks very different. Right. right. But it's like, hang on a second. You're making an argument as if um, that the taxpayer has an ability to, to influence this when we know, in fact, legislatively, that doesn't exist. So right. it's a very, it's a very savvy argument to say, oh, hang on, you know, relative to how many taxes are raised, this is what we're spending, and it's much right. lower than what you think. It's like, but if the fundamental question is, are you asking or are you demanding? Right. And so, and what you just said too, rather than sort of tying it to things like whatever they want to tie it to, whether it's, you know, the crime rates that they, that they develop or whether it's, um, uh, say, population growth in this city, they're actually tying it to taxation growth, which doesn't seem very well correlated uh, to what to like policing efforts, I wouldn't say. You know, I'm fair? glad you I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Joshua. The, the police services board hired a local consultant to help them with their strategic plan. It's a wonderful read. If at any point you want to, if any members are thinking of opening up consulting operations, they're a classic case of what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's so full of holes. It's it's like saying, OK, uh, th there's some pieces in there that saying um, people are very concerned about having a police presence in their neighborhood and dealing with uh, parking violations. Therefore, we're going to increase by a, a magnitude of 10 our investment in technology and police cameras. Huh? Right. How, how did these, th these two things even come together? Hire a consultant. Right, right. <laughs> 
And so, and, and so you just meant, you mentioned it briefly there, uh, something called the Ontario Civilian Police Commission. And this is where if a municipality, and I think you can tell us the, the very short history of how many municipalities have attempted this, but if a municipality does disagree with the police service board budget, that's somewhere where they can take their, uh, their issues to um, the sort of larger, the, the higher oversight uh, uh, commission, I guess. Um, and so what, how, how does that work and, and what, who's, who who's, uh, who's a part of that commission? How do they get there? Good. Well, it's a, this again, an important uh, reason for why the research is so necessary to understand from a campaigning perspective, how do these structures get created? So we go back to 2009, uh, even though there is a longer origin backstory that actually goes back as far as 1962, when they, this entity operated under the name of the Ontario Police Commission. Now it's the Ontario Civilian Police Commission, OCPC. Um, it's composed of members who are appointed by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. There's been, as I mentioned, 70 appointments to date. Okay. Um, the majority of the appointees have legal backgrounds, so they're either lawyers, judges, or police force, police officers. Now, uh, Martin Schutz McAlpine did a great article in Canadian Dimension on this, so credit should be given to him to unpacking the history of this. But he notes that the individuals who are drawn from the OCPC, they, they come from the elite segment of the population. So they're Literally, they're owners of law firms, they're upper management in the private sector, they're individuals who have served in a voluntary capacity with NGOs or on boards or charities. A small percentage, 13% come from public sector management positions. Getting closer, appointees have included members of the Canadian Club of Toronto, the kingpin of elitism, a CEO from the largest law firm in Canada, a former VP of the Federal Conservative Party of Canada, and only two members since 1990 have had what you could liberally say have roots within the workers' movements. None have come from activist groups linked to police oversight issues or racial justice movements. So yes, so the, the legislative structure is let's, let's put a body in charge of overseeing the police and let's stack it with people who are amenable to police oversight and uh, going back to the 18th and 19th century who are interested in protecting class interests. So then let's go to um, you know, a handful of cases in Ontario where there's been a dispute between a municipality and a service board. None of them was a dispute based on defunding. They were all disputes about the degree of increased funding. Okay. And so in, in those handful of cases, the police boards always got their way. And quite often they got their way simply by just threatening to go to the OCPC. They didn't wow. actually have to go through it. They just said, well, you know, we have this disagreement with the municipality. And imagine again, this isn't a situation where police services board will have members on the police services board who are appointed from the municipal council. Okay, wow. so this, this is a very um, insular kind of, you know, uh, cocktail luncheon. Um, so examples, you know, police boards from Niagara, Hamilton, London, Guelph and Toronto threatened to go to the OCPC to win their budgetary. Um, and there's only been one case where they used section 39 bracket five of the act and requested a hearing that was fully and formally invoked. Um, and in all cases, uh, the board either secured all of their budgetary demands from the uh, uh, council. So the system is not structured um, to be able to give a fair hearing to the taxpayer or those interested from the social justice movement or the defund, detask reform side of the equation. Now, I should mention there is a change pending um, when the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, which yes, that does spell COPS. Um, again, their, their absence of originality uh, strikes me. So instead of going to the OCPC in the future, they will go to an arbitration body. But right. again, um, who do you think will sit on the arbitration body? Right. And in terms of, um, you heard a lot, of, uh, especially around sort of, I think, class-based issues, essentially, of where the- Sorry, before yeah. we go there, if I can just add, um, there is another piece. It, um, in the case where, let's say, an activist campaign says, okay, um, we, we, we may not go this police services board route. Um, we want to abolish police services. What's, what's our avenue there? Well, there, COPS has created a new position that's called the Inspector General, and the Lieutenant Governor appoints the Inspector General of Policing. Okay? Um, and what did the Ford government do? Um, they appointed Devin Clunas. Okay? 
uh, Ontario's first inspector general of policing. Who is in uh, Clunas? He's the first black, black inspector general of policing uh, and he will improve the transparency and accountability and help increase trust between public and the police. Um, he's come from Winnipeg. He's got a uh, he's got skin in the game on community policing. So uh, sorry, just to, just needed to add then I, I, what it what it serves to demonstrate the research points out just um, how sophisticated and preemptory the, the legislative thinking is, okay? mm -hmm. which I think forces campaigners to think, OK, well, where, how can we turn? Where can we squirm? Sorry. Right. No, that, that's great. Um, I, I guess, I mean, we might be jumping ahead a bit, but you, you mentioned it there. Where where do you, where, as an activist, or where could an activist or an organization um, that is interested in defund, interested in things like abolish, or even things like detask and reform, where where are sort of the pressures that they can put? Where, where, do, they, where do they seek change through this process? So this is where I think Sandy and Sandy Hudson, Desmond Cole, and other activists I think are correct. You know the the agitation in the streets and and marching on the campaign of defund, abolish the police, coupled with the examples, the nine minute videos, the the other more current Canadian examples where police violence and abuse has been paramount. I think has to be front and center. It has to educate. It has to permeate all aspects of of our community to be able to challenge that. Now, maybe that will trickle up to the point where some of the municipal councillors will begin to rethink their positions. Okay, so you know whether that's the Jim Neals or so, you know some of the other uh, historically progressive councillors will need to start thinking and researching more about their positioning about what they can and cannot do. Uh, Jeff. Uh, who's who's the municipal councillor who is actually on the police services board? His last name is just this, Jeff McLaren. Okay, so th there are individuals who I think that the movement needs to target in order to think strategically about what you can do. Okay, and here's an example I think of where the the, the how you read the legislation can be. Okay, so um, let me just find this here. There's a uh, under the administration and finances section of the COPS Act, section 50 bracket 11, there's an encouraging insert in the legislative language, nudging municipalities to endorse privatization of policing functions at a lower cost, such as court security. So this is a double-edged sword. Right. The province has introduced language to say, hey, if you're in dispute with your police services board, make sure you sit down with them and find the lowest cost way of delivering the police service function. The Ford government is interested in saying, okay, we're setting up the framework to privatize certain functions that right. will appear to commit at a lower cost. But the language also then gives you the opportunity, I think, working with, with some progressive counselors to say, hang on, that language says, um, you know, you, you have to take a look at other ways of delivering police services that can commit at a lower cost. Hmm. Now, isn't that an interesting opportunity to, let's, let's give you an example here. What if the Kingston Community of Campaign did a survey with the housing advocates, with the mental health advocates, with the poverty advocates, and said, tell me what ideas you would do, what would you implement if you had, oh no, let's take a random 25% to $41 million out of the police service budget. If you had 25% to $41 million, how would you deliver community services for mental health, poverty, um, et cetera, et cetera, things that are related to crime and the root causes of crime. And how would you deliver those services? How cost-effective could you be at delivering those services? Well, yeah. now you have a very interesting community-based research project that would generate alternative ways to deliver community safety and well-being using a very different definition, but one that still meets the functional definitions of what policing services meet, and then presented back to council and saying, hey, the legislative authority says that you can instruct the police services board to look for ways to deliver these policing functions at a lower cost. Now, that's flipping the privatization intent on its head and actually making public the costs of policing at a lower cost. Now, in that battle, the police wow. services board might still say, uh, not going to fucking pull the wool over my eyes, Carl. I've been around. Okay. I, I'm going to go to arbitration. But that, and, and they may well do that. But if you imagined 
the appointments of the people who would serve on the police services board to be friendly to this kind of thinking. If you called out Chief McNeely, who's very intent on rebranding policing as a community function, a community benefit, what a pretzel one would have created for her, okay? And so there's a, to me, I think this is a very, this is an opportunity to get a little bit ahead of the game within, within the existing legislative framework, which is set up to strangle, defund and abolish. But whether they win or not, it would make for a fantastic debate if the poverty and health advocate can say, I can deliver uh, services that will undercut the root causes of poverty and crime and do it for a fraction of $41 million. Wow. What, what aspiring politician at the municipal level would say, I'm not buying that. I'd rather buy a tank. <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, especially when you put that in context of what you were speaking to earlier in terms of just sort of the salary differences and the, bud and the budgetary differences between other community services and policing, that really becomes stark in terms of uh, I mean, that's that's really interesting. Um, that sort of intent on privatization, almost being sort of co-opted from the other side. That's really interesting. Um, I guess if I guess uh, for a minute, if we can just bring it uh, back to uh, sort of the Kingston context, although we've been talking a lot about it. Um, but I guess in Kingston, you mentioned earlier that there's uh, four four police, I think, who are currently suspended with pay. Do we have other sort of you know, statistics or numbers about uh, about uh, police, uh, police either violence or police or, or um, in any way sort of racial profiling profiling in the Kingston in in the city of Kingston. Yeah, let me just pull up that section. Uh, give me one second. I just want to make sure I get my, my quote correct. No worries. Okay, so um, here it is. Maybe I'll just ask it again for timing purposes so it looks good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to, to bring it sort of uh, back to the city of Kingston, we've been talking a lot about it already, but I was just wondering if uh, we talked about, you, you mentioned earlier that there's four police currently, I think uh, you mentioned that are currently suspended uh, with pay. I was just wondering if we have other sort of numbers um, that might, and we don't know why they're suspended, but we, I was wondering if we have other sort of numbers that are about uh, whether there's uh, been sort of police violence in Kingston or racial profiling in Kingston. And also, I, I, I think maybe we should get into a bit more about how policing affects different communities differently, especially racialized communities, especially Black, Asian, and Indigenous peoples. So if, if you could speak a bit to that. Sure. Well, I think this, again, goes back to uh, just a little bit of history back to early 2000s. Um, Kingston was, I believe, the first city in Canada to actually conduct a, a research project wow. at the behest of the then police chief, Bill Kloss, um, to document arbitrary stops by police and track uh, race-based data. And so uh, early to, and this came about because of a number of incidents involving a uh, young black man being arbitrarily stopped and um, detained uh, at very dramatic involving police dogs and excessive number of, of police uh, in, in not just once, but a number of times for this one minor uh, wow. who happened to be a young black male and his younger brother. So that, that initiative created a shitstorm in Kingston. I mean, number one, the police service uh, members refused to actually track the data because they didn't uh, they didn't appreciate being uh, accused of being racist. It took uh, considerable effort uh, on, on behalf of the police chief and the community members and members of the police services board at the time to obligate the police to actually collect the data. Lo and behold, when they did collect the data, what did they find after a year of data collection that um, um, black male as were four times more likely to be stopped, arbitrarily stopped by the police in Kingston without due cause. Okay, um, and so you know the, the similar kind of numbers for indigenous uh, individuals as well, more more male than female. Okay, um, as a result of that, uh, many things happened. But one of the things was that the a general order was issued to confirm that the unlawful profiling or bias based bias based policing was prohibited, quote unquote, from Chief McNeely. Okay, what McNeely doesn't say as clearly as she just said in that statement. 
um, is that the Police Services Act regulation specifically, Section 58-16, uh, collection of identifying information in certain circumstances, sets out particular contexts where police can collect race-based data. Hmm. Okay, and so the, again, this is a you know the, the importance of doing the research. Um, a police chief making a quarter of a million dollars can say, "No, a general order was issued. We don't do bias-based policing. It's been prohibited." Right. But we do have a little regulation here on the side that lets us, in right. certain circumstances, collect that same data, and it's detailed. You know, the officer can collect uh, 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 information that is permitted under the prohibition uh, if they're seeking a particular person, if they're seeking someone and the description or image they have describes their racial status, or the police have additional information in addition to the person's racial status that includes a description of height, weight, eye, or hair color, or hairstyle, the additional information, which is not defined, um, the police may have, uh, the, in addition, addition the additional information the police may have that can justify the exemption includes location, type of vehicle, and or the person's associates or their behavior. Okay, so, wow, okay. Hey, uh, the reggae man was just moving, the way he was moving looked suspicious. That's my additional information, officer. <laughs> so these guys, it's very slick. It, 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 you know, do, does, the, does the police, when, we, when I asked the question to Chief McNeely, do you collect data? Do you have this? It was a recitation of this quote. A general order was issued to confirm that the unlawful profiling of bias-based policing is prohibited. Okay. I asked Jeff McLaren, uh, a member of the Police Services Board, do you receive data or reports indicating police abuse or racial profiling? Jeff said, to his knowledge, he doesn't receive those. Hmm. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean it isn't collected. And in fact, now we go to Desmond Cole uh, and, and read his book um, in, you know, uh, in My Skin, I think it's called. Uh, the Toronto Police Service has, has millions of data points that they have collected that are racially profiled, okay? Is, is Kingston different in terms of how they collect data than Toronto? I think not. Hmm. That's interesting. And so what, what is the history of that? When did that come in? So, so we had that, it was in 2000, you said the study that that the legislation they're pointing to is, is suggesting they can't do it. Although your own research suggests that it's per, there is the data is probably there. When did, did that come after it? Or did it come before it, that? It came after it. So I'm, I'm quoting from the Police Services Act, which is, uh, uh, when is that? That's got history going back to 19... Uh, I can, I can, it's in my notes. I'll have to pull that back up, but yeah. uh, it's more recent. So in terms of the sequence, the racial profiling data was collected in 2000. The act with the exemption comes much later. Okay. And yeah. so, I mean, they can, they can point to that anytime. Uh, I mean, they would, anyone asks for information on sort of what data do you have on, on, on police bias in terms of stopping or, or any, anything else really. Yeah, and so, it, you know, it was very difficult to get the, a clear answer on this. Yeah. Right? And I think what's, what's around this question, I think, is very telling. So the question, I think, could then evolve to, so explain to me why the Police Services Board has hired a consultant to do uh, equity, diversity, indigenization, and inclusion with the Police Services Board. What are the motivating factors for you to do that? Did an incident take place? Did more than one incident take place? Okay. Um, um, why have you embarked on your um, engagement with Kingston uh, Community Health Centers on this long-winded community consultation process? What's right. behind that? You know, and why and and why is EDII so prominently measured in that? What is it that you need to learn from your privileged position that would suggest that there is a reason? Is it because can I can I get some data on the uh, equity representation figures of your police force? Why did Constable Abu Bakr, uh, when I first moved to town, um, why is he no longer with the Kingston police? Hmm. You know, and so, I mean, I think there's a series of questions that just need, that can be asked, that don't necessarily need to be answered because the answer is embedded in the question. Right. Okay. Really Cop cops in Kingston, like any institutional entity, are operating with racial profiling as a part of their function and their training and part of their history as we started this conversation. Right. 
And that includes the hiring of, of a black indigenous or people of color into the police service in order to be Uncle Tom. Um, and so I guess if, if we could uh, if we could speak now to a bit of what happened sort of last year in Kingston in terms of the, the movements and the campaigns around uh, defunding um, and, and other campaigns around transforming the police force. What did, did we see uh, sort of the same sort of uh, movements we saw across uh, across Canada, across the United States and elsewhere? Uh, did we see that in Kingston? Was it, have, have sort of groups formed around these ideas? Yeah, you know, I think we, we did. And we've seen some really exciting things, I think, happen in Kingston. The, the fact that defund YGK has been established. Um, that it's a bringing together of a, a very interesting set of activist members, some of which who are clearly in the abolish category and some who are in the you know, defund category. Um, I, I can't recall meeting anybody who was in the reformist category, but um, that doesn't mean that there aren't people who might be attracted to the, to the campaign from a reformist approach. Right. So um, you know, I think there was a very positive sign that that the Kingston community members picked up on and began to engage in this issue, that um, that letters were written in to the editor, that op-ed and editorial pieces in Skeleton Press are happening, that that activists at Queens are making connections between uh, systemic racism that is taking place in the Smith School of Business and the other entities and organizations in the community. So the you know the the BIPOC community attending Queens um, have had negative experiences with the police. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and and some of those are undoubtedly race based or race motivated. So those I think are all very positive signs of how the Kingston community has uh, members. Some members of the Kingston community have responded. Um, Jeff McLaren, uh, as a city councilor, has has taken a very controversial uh, tack as a as a philosopher to argue with his colleagues around the table and with the police service board members saying, hey, racism exists, let's acknowledge that. Um, right. To which you know, some people have said, who misunderstood and heard him saying that Jeff was calling him a racist. And, and so it's like, so those, I think those, um, those steps are an important part of the learning continuum. Right. Right. And so you, you mentioned, so Jeff McLaren, have we heard from any other sort of officials, any sort of, you know, that they've been receptive to these ideas, that, that they've entered their lexicon in any way? So I, I think of Jim, Jim Neal's uh, letter to the editor, which was disappointing and surprising mm -hmm. because he, his letter came out in support of the police and the services they offer, which stands in a bit of contrast to some of Jim's uh, history as a so-called progressive counselor. Um, but I, I think it also speaks to the fact that he understood a little bit of the legislative limitations that exist within the municipality. It, I don't think he put forward the best and most strategic way to encourage people to think differently. He just sure. attempted to shut down the, well, I think the impact of his letter was to try and shut down the debate. Um, whether or not that was his intention or not, I've yet to ask him. Um, <clears throat> as for others, um, you know, I think the police chief and members of the police services have become concerned when when I was doing my research, it became very apparent. Initially, I was dialoguing with different members of the police uh, services for direct answers to direct questions like, you know, the, the crime stats guy um, right. and and the secretary to the commissioner to the police commissioner. And and then at a certain point when it became apparent or when they perceived that the research that I was doing was more in the defund camp, then all of my inquiries got, got uh, directed solely to Chief McNeely and were often delayed by a number of weeks before the responses. And uh, there was a request that my questions be submitted in writing and that the answers were, were carefully vetted before they came back. So in answer to your question, I think that there is, and I, I see this as a hopeful sign, you know, they're, um, they're concerned that right. people are showing inquiry and they're being careful um, and they're trying to keep, stay on brand. Right. You know, these, these, are, these are hopeful signs for activists when, when you're, what is it that Wayne Easter used to say? Um, when you throw a stone at the barn and you hear the pig squeal, you know you're on target. <laughs> <laughs>